It's U of L today on 93.9 The Ville. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. Welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Ville. So glad you're joining us today. As I tell our listeners every time that we talk to them, look, you're going to learn something cool about the University of Louisville, and you're going to be a little smarter than you were 30 minutes before you started listening to this program. So, uh, so there you go. We're going to have about 30 minutes of fun here today. We're going to talk some uh, rather serious issues, but with a couple of fun people. So coming up in the second half of the show today, UofL has a relatively new institute that's doing research, training, and education in the field of geriatrics and senior issues because, of course, we've all got a rapidly growing aging population, not just in Kentucky, but across the world. Anna Fall is the executive director of that Institute for Sustainable Health and Optimal Aging. She'll be here to talk about what UofL is doing in Louisville and across the state to help seniors. But first, I got a very special guest sitting in front of me. Daniel Nocera is world-renowned. I'll give him that big plug there, world-renowned. He's the Patterson Rookwood Professor of Energy at Harvard University, but he's in Louisville to accept the prestigious Leanne Kahn Prize for Renewable Energy, Renewable Energy from UofL. The Leanne Kahn Prize recognizes outstanding renewable energy ideas and achievements with proven global impact and is managed each year by the Kahn Center for Renewable Energy Research at the University of Louisville. So that was a very long intro to you, Dan. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, for having World me. World-renowned. Well, th- thanks for that, too. Yeah, I'll, you like that, too? I'll, I'll take that, oh, Okay, you'll take that one. Um, what do you do at Harvard? Uh, what our professors do, teach <laughs> and educate uh, and the research mission. So what universities actually are here to do is to create new knowledge for other people to learn down the road. So that's, that's the overview, but specifically I worry about energy and solar and renewable energy. And apparently your worrying has uh, produced some results because you've gotten the Leanne Kahn Prize, which is a very prestigious award from the University of Louisville. So congratulations. Yeah, thank you. It's a real honor. And, uh, the prize itself, it, it's its really a great message if you think about it to the world because when people think Kentucky, they think coal, and that's really was a base of our energy economy, uh, and it's been like that. And so for Kentucky then to also say we understand that base, but we're also looking to the future, and that's what this prize is representing is what the future might look like. It's, it's, the fact that it's coming from Kentucky and University of Louisville makes it extra special. So is this just a big egghead thing, the uh, the study of energy, or is this something that, um, as you talked about the other night, that you thought that the poor people of the world and perhaps even the undereducated of the world play a role in helping solve uh, the sustainable uh, energy problems of the future? Most of your energy need is coming from, well, say, the poor parts of the world. So right now there's 7 billion people on the face of the planet, Three billion have no access to energy. So here's an unbelievable thing. 1.6 billion people, as I'm speaking, have never seen an electron in a wire before, have never seen electricity. You, you wouldn't guess that. No, I wouldn't. In, in today. But there's 1.6 billion that have never seen any electricity. The other 1.4 are very low energy users. That's so three billion. And believe it or not, in the next... 40 years, we're going to add three more billion people to the face of the planet, and they're coming into the, that part of the world where there's not much energy. So you're going to have in the next 40 years six billion new energy users, and if you have six billion new energy users, you want them to be using the right flavor of energy because if you think you have problems now, wait, if they take our say wrong flavor of energy, you're going to have really big problems. And the right flavor of energy in your mind is what? Well, renewable energy, uh, energy that doesn't put more carbon into the atmosphere at this point, because we, we are seeing climate change. If you want to blame it on humans or not blame it on humans, that we can get it. That's a different discussion. But I think most people know something's happening. And what are some of the things that you're working on? I, I know some of the things that uh, you got the prize for, uh, I, I'm familiar with, but why don't you describe those um, for the average person who's listening to this radio show, what you're trying to do in your research um, and why you're here. So sunlight you can use uh, as an energy supply. So it turns out in one hour the amount of sunlight and energy that hits the face of the planet is what we use globally in an entire year. 
So can you wow. believe that? No, I so, can't believe that. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> and 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 we don't use it. So when I, by the way, I don't have many friends, so I've adopted some. Uh, the sun. <laughs> so when you're walking around and you feel her warming you, she's talking to you, say, use me, use me, use me. And then the other friends I have are leaves, and there's a lot of them, thank goodness. So I walk around, and there are all my friends, the leaves. And I decided I would like to try to use, be like a leaf, and then use the sun. And that's what leaves do. They use the sun to grow, and that's photosynthesis. And so I wanted to do photosynthesis in the lab. And the way photosynthesis works is you give water to a tree or a plant, and what the leaf is doing is taking in sunlight. It then takes the water and it splits water to hydrogen and oxygen. So I'm a chemist, so we're going to do one chemistry lesson. Water is H2O, two hydrogens on oxygen, H2O. And so what sunlight, what the leaf is doing is it's using the sun to split water to hydrogen and oxygen. You, and it's basically what's called the catalyst. It, it's the intermediary to do that. Thank goodness when sunlight shines on water, it doesn't go to hydrogen or oxygen or we all be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, that would not be good. Had nothing to drink. So um, the leaf in the, is the sort of the middle man, middle woman, who takes sunlight and then operates on water to make hydrogen and oxygen. You know then the oxygen comes out of the leaf. We breathe it. Mm-hmm. It keeps the hydrogen, and then it breathes in CO2, carbon dioxide, from the atmosphere, and it makes biomass or a fuel. And so I decided, could I do that in the lab and then do it with a, whether I call earth abundant materials, not super expensive things um, for the future. Because if you're going to go to the poor, you have to make sure it's inexpensive and not and only, available and available. So that's the next thing. I, I can't have super pure water. I want to be able to use any water like a puddle off the ground. And so that took a lot of research to figure out how can I use water off the ground? What will be my artificial leaf? What's the thing I'll put in between the sun and the water off the ground to make hydrogen? And then in the last few years, we've gone one step further. So we split water to hydrogen and oxygen, which is the front end of photosynthesis. Could we do the back end and take hydrogen and carbon dioxide to make liquid fuels? And we've done that now. That will be part of what I'll be talking about in the prize lectureship uh, so, when I give So that. you've replicated the process of photosynthesis in the lab. Yes. Is that boiling it down to what? Yes. essentially what you've done? Yeah. So it, then the question becomes, can you get it so it's a mass production kind of thing so that it produces enough energy um, you know, like for everybody. Baz- for everybody and a bazillion leaves. Yes. <laughs> so now you start getting to things out of my control. <laughs> Haven't so, gotten that far yet. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, once you go to Matt, can, so the always after you make discussions, uh, discoveries like this, the first thing is when, when can we see it? And that isn't, so as a scientist, I can make the discoveries, but then it's really for society to decide when they're going to use it. And you have to realize, uh, by the way, a lot of people think the oil companies are out to get me and they aren't. Matter of fact, they're very friendly to me. Um, the real the real challenge is that we have a huge energy infrastructure in this part of the world that you've spent hundreds of trillions of dollars on. So when you think about energy, you think about plugging something into the wall. You you had to put all the wires in the ground. You had to get all the mines built. You need railroads. You need to get the oil out of the ground. You have an entire infrastructure that you've built out and paid off. Mm-hmm. And then this guy over here making a discovery is going to upend that entire infrastructure. That's what gets difficult to do. So there's no conspiracy. It's just economics. In this society, we built a massive energy infrastructure. We paid it off. So I call that legacy. We have a legacy of en- And we're going to hold on to that as much as possible. In the poorer parts of the world, let's return to those 6 billion new energy users, Mm -hmm. they haven't done that yet. So they're going to make a choice for the future. And my hope is they're going to choose things like I'm doing, things that scientists are doing right here at the University of Louisville in the Khan Center, 
their energy center at University of Louisville and other scientists around the world. So the goal is, can we get them the right flavor of energy uh, because they don't have, they're not burdened with this massive infrastructure. We are with Daniel Nocera, who is the winner of the Khan Prize, the Leanne Khan Prize from the University of Louisville for Renewable Energy. And he's here talking about renewable energy and what's coming in the future. So what is coming in the future and what are the roadblocks to getting us uh, to this new uh, energy utopia that uh, we hope to reach? Right. So you should realize I want to use sunlight plus water and carbon dioxide to make energy. And that's photosynthesis. That's been going on for 2.6 billion years. Uh, In the last 150 years, we did a different thing. We decided to have a carbon-based economy, coal, oil, and gas. So you should realize the oil companies are the new people on the block of energy. Um, I'm the conservative voice of energy. When I say in the future we're going to be using so, because I don't want anything to change. It's what's been working for 2.6 billion <laughs> years. So I'm the conservative, and the liberals are these <laughs> oil companies because they're doing something that's only been around 150 years. So when I look to the future, I'm actually looking to the past saying, what's worked for 2.6 billion years? Let's stick with it. Seems like <laughs> it's a pretty good thing. And so that's what I see the future as, that you'll actually – just be able to use the energy around you. The added feature is that you'll be able to do it in a more distributed way. If you think about how we do energy in this part of the world, the developed world, it's centralized and we distribute. I see as we move to the future, it's going to be a distributed energy model where you use the resources around you. Of course, the sun is all around you and it's following you, so everybody has access to it. So I think that will be the energy utopia. The second piece is, are, do we have the ability to do it? And I can honestly say I've never been more elated in my life. In the last 20 years, scientists and engineers are really figuring out how to do that all. And all the pieces are getting in place. So when all your listeners are at home sleeping in bed, they should know there's this massive global it's a global science and engineering effort. Uh, and so you're optimistic. I'm totally optimistic. Yeah. And I see a future and I know it's going to be okay. Okay. So, maybe. So, so I'm going to put a maybe. So these folks are saying maybe it's going to be okay, maybe. So these folks are saying, you know what, oil prices are down. Uh, you know, we shouldn't worry about that, you know, that re- renewable energy, sustainability. You know, that's just stuff that those greenies are talking about. We don't need to worry about that. We got plenty of oil and it's cheap. Let's not worry too much about it. And they've downgraded, you know, they say, let's just kind of downgrade our efforts in those areas. Right. You're saying that a, that's not happening at least right now. Right. Okay. And you're optimistic that research will continue in those areas, no matter what happens with oil prices and, and big oil. Yeah. I think the world is coming to the conclusion that, um, we have an energy system that is disrupting the planet. And let's get down to real cost. When you're putting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, an ocean might rise two or three inches. So what happens when you start having water show up into most of your major financial districts? Our society is going to pay a heck of a lot of money to build dams to do water management. And we're talking not, we're talking tens of billions of dollars. That's what I see in the future. I see a lot of particulate emission, especially in the poor parts of the world. Now, unfortunately for, say, people sitting here in Louisville or me sitting in Boston, if the particulate goes up in the air over there, it doesn't stay over there. It's going to come over here. So it's to our benefit to start worrying at a global level what's going in the atmosphere. That's leading to a lot of asthma. That's leading to a lot of medical problems. So the thing we haven't realized or got our head around yet, and it's a little hard to get our head around, is what is the true cost of doing business as usual? As those costs start to mount, there's going to be a push to say, we better go this different direction where we're not doing business as usual. And that's the maybe. When will that click into society as a whole? And that I'm not sure of yet. Okay. Well, Daniel, Sarah, we never really got to talk about the storage issue, but uh, that's an issue for another day. And I know the con center is working on it as well as you are. So keep working on that because that is, the, that is one of the tough issues as well facing, facing us in the future. Is it not? 
Yep, okay. it's my job. It's Con Center's job, University of Louisville job. We'll get it done. Okay, very good, Daniel Serra. Thanks so much for being with us, and again, congratulations on winning the Leanne Con Prize for Renewable Energy. Thanks. U of L. Thanks, thanks for being in town. Anna Fall is the executive director of the Institute for Sustainable Health and Optimal Aging. She's a part of the faculty in the Kent School of Social Work, which is one of the top social work programs in the country. And now she's got a new adventure. Well, I'm calling it a new adventure, uh, which is this Institute for Sustainable Health and Optimal Aging. So welcome back, Anna. You've actually been on the program before. So welcome back. Thank you. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the Institute for Sustainable Health and Optimal Aging. That's a big, long title. What does it mean? What it really means is that we're trying to bring uh, many, many disciplines together to work in a transdisciplinary way to create optimal aging environments and to create optimal health in our communities for people who are aging. And that really means all of us. Um, well, yeah, as, it means me for sure. Absolutely, <laughs> me included. So what it means is that as we age, it, we, we, we need to find ways in which we can do that in an optimal way. And I'm not talking now about being disease-free. What I'm talking about is despite disease, despite illness, despite getting older, despite having the pain in your bones when you get up in the morning, that you can still live optimally, that you can still find a way to find pleasure in life and that you can figure out a way to be happy until the end of life. So that's our goal, and we work with many, many disciplines together um, at the university and also with many community partners to develop this new vision that we have for aging and also for aging in place so that people don't have to move out of their homes, that the resources will be there, and that they can really age in a very healthy way. And as the population gets older and older, this is getting more and more important, isn't it? It's getting very, very important. It's actually becoming the big industry. And if you look at Louisville, we have so many aging industries currently here. So one of the goals is to get these industries involved in getting um, on board with this vision and to create, for example, age-friendly cities where we don't have to rush across the street, but we can walk across the street <laughs> because we're older and we need a little bit more time. Also, where we can sit on a bench and rest a little bit, don't have to stand all the time. Where businesses are more age-friendly, where you can be able to go to the bathroom if you have to go without having to do business at that business. So it's a variety of things that make us just more aware of the wonderful thing of aging, that we are all aging in a, in a great way and that we need to figure it out together to do it in a very positive way. You said this was interdisciplinary. What does that mean to people who don't understand how universities work? What, right. is, what does interdisciplinary mean? So actually you get multidisciplinary, then you get interdisciplinary, and then in the end we really want to move to transdisciplinary. Now if you look at what is um, multidisciplinary, that would mean I would work with an older adult and I would try to do what I can as a social worker. An engineer will try to develop something for that older adult, and they will do that on their own. Uh, a person in the field of nursing will go and serve that person in terms of their health needs, but it will be totally separate from the social worker. So that's multidisciplinary. If you want to move to interdisciplinary, people are at least talking. I will talk to the nurse, the nurse will talk to me, and we will talk to the engineer, we will talk to the lawyer. We will all talk together, but we will still be sort of independent doing our stuff. When we look to transdisciplinary, that's when we really try to understand each other's work and we're trying to collectively make a difference. So, for example, I will be as a social worker able to go into the house of an older adult, look at the medicines, and at least know that I need to talk to a pharmacist about these meds because there seems to be interactions going on here. I will have just enough knowledge to know I need to work with a pharmacist. And that's sort of the way that we look at life right now is that you need to bring a variety of disciplines together to make the life of an older adult very positive and healthy. We're talking to Anna Fall, who is the director of the Institute for Sustainable Health and Optimal Aging at the University of Louisville. And she's actually talking to all of us who are probably above 50 is what you're actually talking and, and the folks you're trying to serve. And that includes me and Anna, by the way. Um, so what else does th this institute aim to do on the ground? Are you doing research? Are you... Uh, physically helping people get located in nursing homes and in care facilities? What, what are some of the things you're actually doing? So we have four, four arms. Uh, one is innovation. So we try to work with industry and also try to work with um, the Speed School of Engineering to develop technologies that can sufficiently help sustain older adults in their homes. So that's one thing, boots on the ground, develop technologies. And what we do at the Institute is we have a participant registry. So people, we, we get people to test technologies. Uh, so that's very nice to- Like what? What, what would be a so technology? For, so for example, um, 
older adults and their weight. Sometimes when they're very at, 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 at um, late stages of their lives, a very small changes in their weight can be very traumatic, especially when you're dealing with heart failure and things like that. So the Speech School of Engineering students are developing for us a toilet that can measure your weight and can measure changes in weight. Really? So, yeah. So what we will do is the students develop it. We take that prototype and we ask a group of older adults to test this out for us. And in that way, we can track their weight and they can actually report back to their physician if they see a change that the physician will tell them would be alarming. So those are little, little things, but yeah, it really makes cool. a big difference. So, so that's the innovation mm -hmm. part. Then we have the education part. And that is where we, we just got 2.55 million from the Department of Health and Human Services to help educate the workforce. Educate the workforce in how to really effectively care for older adults. Because if you look at an older adult who's 70, 80 years old, their vital signs are slightly different that you need to be alarmed about. You don't need to be alarmed necessarily about an A1C level if you are a person of diabetes that is um, seven. You may have to change that a little bit to eight or nine. It depends. It depends on the disease and it depends on the vital sign. But the issue here is, is that you need to look at an older adult slightly different and people don't always know that and people also don't know that you need to work with a group of individuals around that older adult to help them get to the healthy fruits and vegetables to help them get to the transportation they need to get to the doctor so all of these things we are educated physicians social workers nurses pharmacists dentists uh, all to work together to create an environment of care for the older adult so that's our educational component we also have a research component where we do research with older adults on a variety of things. We look at balance studies. Um, we look at actually researching this new model of care coordination and see what it does for the health of older adults. And then we have a practice component. And our final practice component really is in development phase right now. We want to create an optimal clinic where older adults can come to and we can really, you know, if you need to learn how to cook, you've never cooked in your life, but now you've been told you really need to eat these different diet well we are so, there so if you're a widow your wife just died she did all the cooking for 50 years and you're 70 something years old and never boiled water in your life they can maybe come to this clinic and learn how to do that exactly exactly we life also skills right we can also give them a massage if they need that you know for their bones that may be aching there's a variety of things that you can do and that we as a one-stop shop want to provide that for them. So that'll be the practice component that we try to develop. Also care coordination, health navigation is currently crucial. So we want to have health navigators out there that can work with an older adult, help them to get to the resources they need and help them navigate a very complicated and difficult system of resources that's, that is available in our community but not always utilized. And your institute recently received uh, what, a two and a half uh, million dollar grant um, to go out into the rural areas, correct, and, and right. do some of this work. So tell well, us about that. So what we do is we work with primary care practices in six rural counties in the state of Kentucky. And it's Hart, Metcalf, Barron, Bullitt, Henry, and Shelby counties. So what we do is we work with the primary care practices to tell them, you know, social determinants of health determine a lot of the health of your older adult that you're serving. So why don't you refer to us anyone with two or more chronic conditions that are 65 and older, and we will work with them and with your team to figure out a way to keep them healthy in the community. So then we mobilize coalitions in the community, and these coalitions help us identify resources in that community. We have been dealing, for example, with an older adult who cannot get to a doctor because she doesn't have any transportation. She's been trying to find transportation, couldn't get it. So it was very easy for a health navigator to connect that older adult to transportation to get her to the specialist she needs to see for her heart condition. So we are, we are coming into these practices, teaching the doctors, teaching the nurses, teaching the social workers there how to reach out to the community and provide them with the resources they need to help us with an overall method of caring for older adults. Is it harder for older adults in rural areas to get services or is it easier perhaps because there's a more neighborly environment uh, in small towns than there is you know, in the You know, there may be a, maybe a neighborly environment in small towns, but there's also a lack of knowledge in small towns and a lack of necessarily understanding what is needed to help older adults. So the rural areas it deals with a lot of isolation. It deals with a lot of not knowing where to go. So 
community coalitions has become the core of what we're trying to develop here. So these coalitions are community partners who work together to create awareness in the community. So they do support programs, they do educational programs, and they educate the communities in these rural areas. So I would say rural areas is much more complicated to reach out to. What's the biggest problem in your mind that Louisville faces as we have this population just like everybody else does that's getting older and older and living longer and longer? I, I think lack of resources for them. Um, they are, yeah, well. Specifically, what, what, what resources do you not think we, we do a good job of here in Louisville or elsewhere? I th well, nationally, and I just came back from a national conference, um, what I talk a lot about is the lack of transportation. So transportation is huge. We don't have a very good public transportation system that reach all of our older adults, even in the rural counties, you know. So, so it's very hard for them to get to a food place, to, you know, even to pick up free food. It's hard if you don't have transportation. Mm -hmm. So nationally, there's movements going to figure out how we can create better transportation systems. That's very, very needed right now. Um, and there's many more, but overall, it's the influx of the baby boomer generation and the, the needs that the baby boomers are expressing that they want to age in place. And we need to find ways in which we can make it possible for them to age in place. You can, If you start building nursing homes today, you will never be able to provide enough space for all the people who's going to age and who need that care. So you need to work towards a change of mind in providing that care to the older adult in the home. And therefore, we need resources, and we need a lot of resources for that. We're talking with Anna Fall from the Institute for Sustainable Health and Optimal Aging at the University of Louisville. We've got a couple minutes here left. The, there has been a large influx of Hispanics and other refugees from all over the place, uh, all over the world here into Louisville. Has that presented a, a new set of problems when you have folks uh, coming from Syria and Cuba who are 50, 60 years old and are looking for um, elderly services? Is that a different dynamic than just me and you going out and trying to find uh, something for our mom and dad? It definitely is a different dynamic because you're dealing with language issues. Um, so if you think about the Hispanic population that we're trying to specifically reach out to in Shelby County, it's very difficult because many times the older adults don't speak English. Their children speak English, and the children need, and that child is probably in elementary or middle school, and uh, or the grandchild is in elementary or middle school, and is the only English-speaking person in that whole family. So to navigate resources when you can't even speak English, that's very, very hard. And um, so we've seen in our in 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 this specific county how important lay community workers are. We call them promotores um, that reach out. And that really are the people working at the churches, working with these individuals who speak Spanish. They come to us for training, and then they go out in these communities to provide them with understanding of resources and understanding of how to navigate a system. So, Okay, so it does add a different dynamic then. It definitely does. And also, one of the problems is, is that we have very, many, very little English-speaking people here in the States that can speak Spanish well. So we're actually sending some of us on a, on a Spanish immersion course to learn how to speak Spanish because we need to do that reach out to the Spanish population. All right, Anna Fall, any final words about the Institute before we wrap it up here? Well, what I want to say is we're going to have a conference in June, June 12 to um, 13, here in Louisville at the Brown Hotel. Anyone who wants to find more information about that can, can call the Institute, and we will provide more information. Okay. Now, as you know, you've been on the program before. We always wrap up by uh, doing a Did You Know segment, a little tidbit about the University of Louisville. So here's, here's uh, to you. Anna is part of the faculty at the Kent School of Social Work, which is one of the top social work programs in the country. In fact, the did you know for today, did you know that U.S. News and World Report ranks the Kent School the top social work program in Kentucky and top 40 in the entire United States? And in fact, the graduate degree programs are ranked as high as eighth in the country from the Speed School. So we've got one of the best uh, schools of social work in the country at U of L, and Anna's a part of that. So congratulations. Thank you, Mark. All right. You can catch video of these programs throughout the week on Metro TV. So thanks to Mayor Fisher and Metro TV Director Debbie Harsmeyer for that. Also, KET3 airs UofL Today with Mark Hebert each Thursday at 5. And you'll see me each Monday morning around 9.30 on Great Day Live on WHAS-TV with Rachel and Terry Miners. And I'll have a story about research or great students or something cool going on at the University of Louisville each week on Great Day Live. So thanks to you all for listening, and go Cards!